Welcome to a Legendarium special called Creating Stonehenge. In this episode, we will talk about late Neolithic society and how they created the megaliths that dot ancient Britain, including early versions of Stonehenge. We will then talk about how workers raised the stones and the communal and religious feasts held at Stonehenge. Sometime around 4000 BC, the agricultural revolution came to Britain. A small scattered population of several thousand that had lived by foraging and hunting began to clear trees to create pastures for domestic stock and cultivate ridges for growing cereals. As the Neolithic farmers cleared more land for their crops, wooden foragers' huts vanished in favor of sturdier wattle and daub houses, meant to stand for generations. Social hierarchies emerged, with wealthy farmers wearing elaborate collars and amber jewelry to show their status. Kings wore distinctive hairstyles, shaving their foreheads and then bundling up the rest of their hair like a mohawk. To hold it in place, they used resin imported from the Pyrenees, the ultimate status symbol at the time. Late Neolithic farmers raised pigs and cows for meat and milk, the basis of their diet and livelihood. They still gathered wild mushrooms, berries, and plants, and sometimes hunted wild animals, but they also turned to cereal cultivation, using grain to make porridge. To mark the land as theirs and their ancestors, agrarian communities built stone monuments to house the bones of their ancestors. The British Isles are dotted with such creations, the most famous of which is Stonehenge. Another example of a megalith is found in Ireland, a vast necropolis complex called Newgrange, with bones arranged in decorative patterns, surrounded by standing stones that tracked the rising and setting of the sun, much like Stonehenge. Irish farmers erected it around 3200 BC, even before the construction of the pyramids. It is 250 feet across, 39 feet high, and covers an acre of ground. The entrance of New Grange leads to a 62-foot passage that opens to a central chamber housing bone-filled recesses. A wide range of supporting resources would be needed to build New Grange. Timber rollers to move the stones, ropes to hold them up, and boats to float them from their source, which was often far away. Indeed, we will see a similar infrastructure used to build Stonehenge. Stonehenge began construction in the Mesolithic era between 8500 BC and 7000 BC as four or five pits, three of which held pine posts which would have looked much like totem poles. At a time when woodland covered most of southern England, the chalk downland of Sarum may have been an unusually open landscape. Little is known about these early posts, but around 4,000 years later, local people built a new complex made of two rectangular earthworks and several long barrows, all dating from about 3500 BC. It is likely that a series of sacred places being located in these chalk downlands influenced the eventual location of Stonehenge. The next major construction took place in 3000 BC, when builders constructed a circular ditch with an inner and outer bank that enclosed an area about 300 feet across. This ditch was dug with simple antler tools and the chalk piled up to make the inner and outer banks. This would have been one of the first henges built in Britain. 56 pits called the Aubrey Holes have been found, though it's unknown if they held stones or timber posts. Within this enclosure, people buried the cremated remains of their friends and relatives. With 150 persons buried there, this became the largest cemetery of the late Neolithic. Around the year 2500 BC, stones were set up in the center of the monument. The builders used two types of stones, the larger sarsens and the smaller bluestones. Sarsens were put in two concentric arrangements, an inner horseshoe and an outer circle, while the bluestones were set up between them in a double arc. Made of sandstone, they were quarried about 20 miles away in Marlborough Downs, then likely moved on greased logs to the construction site. Another 300 years later, the central blue stones were rearranged to make a circle and inner oval. These stones may have been moved by water, going down the Bristol Channel about 80 miles and then moved over land. 
After the stones arrived, laborers shaped them with sarsen and flint hammer stones. The bigger tools flaked and chipped the stone while the smaller tools smoothed the surfaces. To fit the upright stones with horizontal lintels, workers made mortise holes and protruding tenons. These lintels were slotted together using tongue and groove joints, just like in woodworking. To stand a stone upright, people dug a large hole with a sloping side. They then lined the back of the hole with wooden stakes, moved the stone into position, and hauled it upright using ropes made of plant fiber and a wooden frame. Weights helped to tip the stone upright, and finally, workers packed the hole with rubble and shaped the tenons to ensure the best possible fit. These construction methods remind us that these late Neolithic societies were very sophisticated cultures, capable of large-scale engineering projects. Most of the construction on Stonehenge took place during a time of rapid transition as the world entered the Bronze Age. More people began arriving in Britain from the continent, bringing new ways, new tools, and new technology, most notably metalworking, which led to a profound change in society. Indeed, during the early Bronze Age, more round barrows were built in the area around Stonehenge. However, in the centuries to come, Bronze Age communities focused more on clearing new fields rather than building monuments. This is especially important because it could take 20 years to clear an acre of farmland. Nonetheless, about 134,000 animal bones have been found around Stonehenge, along with bronze cauldrons and bowls. These likely came not only from feeding workers during the construction, but in communal and religious feasts held at the Great Henge, even into the Bronze Age. Cattle and pigs would be driven from as far north as Scotland to join in the events. The cattle and pigs would either be herded over land or taken by boat. Milk played an important role at these feasts, but since people at this time tended to be lactose intolerant, that meant the milk had to be processed into yogurt that resembled cottage cheese. These feasts would be supplemented with nuts and berries gathered in the area. Most of these lavish events would be held at midwinter and midsummer, as the other henges were also built to align with the movements of the sun during those times of the year. Indeed, the first 1,600 feet of the avenue from Stonehenge is built on the axis of the summer solstice sunrise and the winter solstice sunset, with the stones marking the rising and setting of the sun during those two times of the year. We do not know if this was a part of sun worship or calendar keeping or both, but it is a reminder that the people of late Neolithic and early Bronze Age Britain were part of a much more sophisticated culture that shared common customs all the way from Sarum to Scotland. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.